expecting that. That was an unexpected blessing. But I received that. Thank you very much. And uh, this is just try to keep it from sliding quite so much. So praise the Lord. All right, we got to bring it down. I'm shorter than most. Wait, yeah. You can, okay. If you want to hold the mic. Okay, right, that is good. <coughs> yeah, no, wait a minute. <laughs> I want to eat it. It's just a little close. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. You really need to have your mic. You really need to have your mic. Is that good? Right here. Right here? Right in my face? Okay. All right. We'll do it that way. All right. Thank you. Praise the Lord, saints. Good. Good morning. Thank you for everyone who is here. We are here. We came in from Michigan. From the, uh, We live in southeast Michigan in the Detroit suburban area. And uh, go Lions. Ha, ha, ha. Yes. We, and the Tigers. They just won. So we're excited. We're excited. They want to pin it. So good things are happening in Detroit. And I bring that up for a reason. When the Lord started training me in ministry, in my first time in ministry, I was four. And I am going to open us in prayer. But just to give you a little backdrop, I started praying at the age of four. Because my dad's sister was the prayer warrior. She happened to marry uh, one of the first men of color to teach aviation in the United States. So they did well financially, and they had a custom-built house in Nashville, Tennessee, and she built a prayer room in the house. And so when I was a little girl and I would play with my Barbie doll or whatever was in tow, uh, she would tell me, go in there and pray. I would spend six weeks every summer with her. And she would say, go in there and pray. And what I love about the foundation is I went in there. Barbie sometimes went in with me or whatever toy I had. My pigtails might be in two different directions. Uh, I might have some of the dirt from the day. And what I loved about that is I would say, well, what am I supposed to do? She said, go in there and talk to God and then be quiet and listen. <laughs> and what I loved is she never did at the same time every day. I never had to take a bath and put on all white. I just went in as I was. And so I was very, very blessed. I have an unusual foundation because very few people can attest to starting a prayer life at that young of an age. It was also the same year that I was sexually abused by a babysitter. As I learned over the time of my life, the Bible says that Satan comes immediately to steal that word. I didn't understand for years a great, great confusion because I didn't understand how can I be talking to God and then be sexually molested at the same time. Didn't make sense. Creates great confusion in your life. But I learned the word later on and I understood that. So I just want to give you just a little understanding of where I'm coming from. And we'll talk a little bit more with you guys. I'm excited to be here. I want to thank Mark. Mark has been part of our call for several years now. And I appreciate him. I appreciate Pastor Earl and Pastor Pamela uh, for having us come. My husband, Ron, will speak next. But we appreciate you taking this time out of your day. I know there are other things you could be doing. But this is a critical time in our nation. We're fighting for the soul of our country. And uh, prayer is going to be a critical weapon that we must all have in our arsenal if we're going to get anything accomplished. So with that, Father, we just thank you. We just honor you. We glorify you. I ask first and foremost, Lord, forgive me my sins. Blot out the handwriting of the ordinance written against me, O oh God. I ask, Lord, that I would decrease so you can increase. I ask, O oh Lord, the Holy Spirit, you'll customize this time today, not just with me, but with every speaker, so that every single person will feel like, you know what, I'm alone with God. And he heard my cry, and he heard my heart, and he spoke a word directly to me. Custom fit, tailor the messages, Lord, for every soul here, and for those that watch it later in replay. We just cover this entire experience and everyone connected to it with the blood of Christ. We refute and rebuke all the plans and the schemes and the taxes of the enemy, the sorcery, the witchcraft, the spells, the incantations, everything invoked, every ill wish and word curse, every weapon, Father God, every directed energy weapon, every form of sorcery and demonic technology be damned. And we thank you, Father God, that you'll get the glory in this. And each and every speaker, you'll be glorified. And each and every speaker, you'll be recognized. And each and every hearer, your voice will speak to their soul. And we just cover and seal this day with the precious blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. 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 So Mark said, I mentioned the books. I guess we'll get the housekeeping out of the way.
And this is the book. I guess Mark can put a picture of it on the, it was called On the Call on the Wall. And to be honest, I was not intending to write a book. This, this is hilarious because I had no intention of writing a book. I was never going to be an author. I was never going to put my story out there. But one day I sat down at my computer and I started typing. And about 20 pages came out. I thought, hmm, wonder what I'm doing. And maybe about a week or so later, I sat down again. And another 20 pages popped out. I said, whew, I think I'm putting a book together. Then everything went black. <laughs> once I realized I was writing a book, then I was trying to write a book. And radio silence from heaven. For three months, I couldn't put a thing on the page. The minute I realized what I was doing, I began to try to do it. And it was, it was ridiculous. Nothing would come out. So finally, I just took my rest and said, you know what, Lord? If you want a book, you'll, you'll inspire me to go back. And I waited. And it was about three months before I finished writing. And I sat back down under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and I finished the book. And it, it shares from that story I shared with you at the beginning of this, all the way up to where I am now. And it is, it is a, it's transparent, maybe too transparent for my husband's taste, but he loves me anyway. But I, I have always been open about my life. I, even as a little child, even if I got in trouble, I would always tell the truth because lying was exhausting. I, I never understood how people did that. Because once you tell one lie, then you gotta remember that lie and cover up the other lie and go back. I was like, oh, I don't care, I just, you know what, well, I did it, you know. Flog me, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, I, just, I, was, I was easier with that. So telling the truth has always been something that I prefer, even if it costs me something. We're, Mark wants us to talk about the foundation of prayer. I know that in many ways you already understand this. I don't want to preach to the choir, but I do want to talk about certain strategies. Those that are on our prayer call, is there anyone else here from Zechariah 2 5? We have Mark and Marianne, and there's another one on the way. So thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Christine is on the way up from New York City. And uh, we thank the Lord. That prayer call uh, covers now just about, we have people from almost all 50 states, and from Canada, and from England. And then I do another international prayer call on a separate day with friends from Israel, from England, from Finland, from Germany. And so... We're, the Lord really has expanded this very, very much. I teach on restoration. Uh, I am a restoration minister, if you will, uh, for our, Catholic, our academy, GCU Academy. My husband and I fo helped found it with our president, Apostle Bill Hodge. And when we started, you could put the entire, I'm sure Pastor Pamela can understand this. When we first started that ministry, you could put everything we had in a box. We literally, the entire ministry went in a box along with a PowerPoint. And you could stick it all in the back seat or in the trunk. That was the beginning. You know those days, you remember the Pastor Pamela, where it was just you all. And you're schlepping around hoping someone will listen to you talk about why chaplaincy is important. And I'm here to tell you today that the Lord has, I have five minutes left? Okay. And I'm here to tell you that God has expanded it internationally. So with prayer, okay, I thought I had more time. I thought there was one of the ministers not coming. So I'm going to get right in. I'm not going to be able to, I was told 30 You're minutes. Right. Huh? You're right, you got 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes, okay. Well, we're going to jump right in. So, again, because I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, I don't want to tell you the importance of prayer. I think you know that. But I do think strategic prayer is important. I, a couple of things that I do do uh, that I think are important is praying the word. Uh, how many of you know to pray the word of God? And what I mean by that is if, you pull out like Psalm 2 because of time. I won't go there, but you'll pull out Psalm 2 or Psalm 64 or Psalm 61. You pull out a specific prayer and you speak that over your life or you speak it over the lives of others or you speak it over your city, state, and nation. Why is that important? Because we're living in an end time where the battlefield has really increased. I'm not trying to be partisan, but... I feel that you need to know this, what, rather what side of the aisle you're on. I'm not, I, you know, I tend to not fall into the black, you know, the blue and red magic because that can be a trick of the enemy. But in full disclosure, there are particular groups, in particular the one, there's one called Witches for Common. And the reason I'm bringing that up, especially since I have a limited amount of time, if we're going to be strategic, we need to understand how the enemy operates. The Bible says we're not to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. 
Witchcraft has been around since Pharaoh's day. Amen. If, if you're looking at me across, I try to figure she's got to be making this up. Well, then you need to go and study your Bible some more. Because Pharaoh had magicians that operated. That's who Moses faced off with. We know that the Magi came and told the king that we've been looking at the stars because that's where everything was originally written. And uh, we see that the, a king has been born or being born and we want to go worship him. So that's always been a part of it. Astrologers, magicians, all of them always been a part of the king's court. Look at Daniel. The, the, none of the magicians had the authority or the power to interpret the dream, so they had to get one of the new God, Elohim. So this has always been a part of it. So this is not new, but it is an area that a lot of people do not pay attention to. For sake of time, I'll just say this. Uh, this has been, I remember specifically when uh, 44 was running for office and they showed a group of Kenyan witches that were invoking all the way from there. They were saying, we're going to get him in office. And then when his, his running mate ran, um, they said, we'll be praying for him and invoking for him. And now here we go, the same team. Now they have Kam uh, witches for Kamala. And that's what they do. They invoke and they cast spells and they work in the spirit realm to bring about what they want in the natural. The problem is the body of Christ is sitting around trying to occupy pews, get their solo, do whatever thing in the natural that they think honors God, but they're not fighting at the level that the enemy is fighting. And we need to raise our game as intercessors. We need to understand that this, this is not tiddlywinks. This is not play at all. When I first started intercession, you know, the big issues were divorce, cancer, need a new job. I miss those days. Because now I have people say, can you pray my child's transitioning, becoming a boy? And you know, it's a whole nother level of what people, I have, we have friends who are battling direct energy weapons, who have third degree burns on their bodies because the enemy is, the, the government is shooting weapons through their house and burning them in the middle of the night. Well, it's, it's a whole nother level that we are dealing with. And a lot of people don't believe that, but I, I, in case you did not know that because my time is so short, our government is not our government anymore. It's not the government of we the people. We're, we're that, that's, that ship has been sailed. And I could go in, if I had time, I could teach a whole bunch of reasons why that, but I would just, to sum it up, everything you see in the natural started in the spirit. Everything you see, the open borders, when the Holy Spirit was talking to me about it, the open borders was just a reflection of the way the church is operating. We said, come on in and come as you are, which is fine, except we allowed you to stay as you are. We didn't make any type of demand. We took the words like sin and offense out, and we said, just come on in and have your way and be who you are and we'll love you anyway. We did a kumbaya Jesus happy hour. And we got rid of things that brought conviction. The Holy Spirit is the only one that's going to have the power to bring conviction. I would suggest to you that when you're praying, because of time, I won't go into everything I have prepared here, but I will say this. You want to cry out for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. Because I'm going to tell you, you can't beat the Bible upside a sinner's head and they're going to receive. They have to have it revealed to them. We have to bring Jesus back into the public square. We have to bring words like sin back into the public square. We have to bring things like transgression, iniquity, generational curses, things that are active. We have to bring the fact in that the enemy is using his sorcerers to produce these types of dark things that we're all battling against. And if we don't elevate in our prayer lives, we will never be a counteroffensive. We will never be able to strike and pull out the arrows of the enemy if we don't raise our level as intercessors, if we don't raise our level of discernment. I suggest you don't follow anybody that tickles your ear. Ask Holy Spirit, am I to be listening to this individual? Because it's a lot of voices out now. I could go on and on for hours about that being another problem. So many voices, thanks to the internet, everyone is a, is a, a prophet, a pastor, an evangelist, you know, everyone's hearing from Jesus. Which Jesus? The Bible says there will be many. So which Jesus? We got to stop using Jesus like a Costco brand and slapping it on everything. We have to be discerning people. 
We have to ask Holy Spirit, by what spirit does this come? He said, test the spirit by the spirit, not by how you feel. The world is becoming more emotive. The world is telling you that transformation is okay. Transfiguration is what Jesus became. We have to be transfigured. We have to be transformed into his image. The reason you're seeing this trans agenda expand like it is is because the church has not put the demand on transforming in his image. This is just all you have to do, like I said, because of time's sake, I don't want to get flagged and gonged out of here. But I want you to understand that every natural thing that you're seeing, there's a spiritual component. Open borders is because the church let down the borders and the standards. We don't hold people to holiness. We don't hold people to accountable. You're hearing all these pastors being caught up in sex scandals. Why is that happening? Is it because they just can't keep their pants in? No, it's because there's no accountability. There's no one coming alongside because the church is making money. I'm the assistant pastor. I'm the deacon. We're all got a slice of the pie. So I look the other way when they're a pedophile. I look the other way when they went in the office and shut the door and that wasn't their wife. We have to be able to call sin out. Otherwise, we're going to continue to hear the stories, whether it's Robert Morris and, and Gateway, whether it's Hillsong, Pick one, TD Snakes, pick it all, pick one. They're all out there, and they're there because no one held them accountable. No one said, look, guy, you, you don't need to go to Diddy's Park. Maybe it doesn't look good as a pastor to have your wife twerking. No, where was the voice for that? Where was, has anybody ever wondered that? Where was the voice for that? Who, why didn't somebody ask Robert Morris exactly what is moral failure? Remember how he softened it up? And he said, well, I had more faith. No, he was an adult having a sexual relationship with a minor, a 12-year-old. That's not a moral failure. Accountability must be restored to the church. Amen. Accountability must, and as an intercessor, I admonish you, put that requirement of holiness back in. Put that requirement of discerning back in. Put the demand on the word of God. Everyone who's on my prayer call knows I tell them, never put the pressure on yourself, put the pressure on the word. If God has got enough to put it in the word, he's got enough to perform it. I expect my whole house to be saved because he said that. I expect deliverance to come to my house because he promised me that. I expect holiness to be a part of our generational bloodline because we put the demand on it as a husband and wife. Ron and I put that requirement on it. You won't get it unless you have not because you ask not, right? Yes. Put the promises and the pressure in the same place and say, God, you are going to perform your word because you are faithful and you are good. And with that, we close out. I'm getting the flag over here. And uh, I would have loved to share some more. I have plenty. As you can see, I'm always over-prepared. But thank you so much. One, I one, have more, a thing, question. one more thing. Then there go two slides. Everybody can see her book. Okay. And if you have any questions, I'll be whenever. Are we doing a Q and A panel or whatever? Q and A. You'll be around to talk. Okay, I'll be around somewhere. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry for it being so quick. Ivan Rod. Uh, last year, Ivan Rod did a phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal presentation on the uh, spiritual aspects of um, yoga. And uh, we have a, I have another good friend here named uh, Michael Austin, who at one time was, for 15 years, was the chief assistant of probably the fifth or sixth greatest Hindu guru in the world. And between these two gentlemen, I've been trying to get them together for a long time, so I'm very excited to sit down and eat with eat, have. Oh, by the way, we invite all of you to a banquet tonight at the Princess Helena Club over on uh, Oak Street in Saratoga Springs. We'll put the address up so everybody can get there. Everyone is invited. There'll be a banquet tonight. We're going to start it at about 6.30. You'll get a chance to sit with many of the speakers and, um, and, uh, and, and talk some more and discuss some more things. But anyway. Is the internet invited? The, is the internet invited? Yeah. <laughs> if you can drive there, you're invited. All right, but Ivan Raj is going to come and he's going to do a presentation for us on the occult experiences that undermine cultures and over and, uh, and actually undermine nations. Ivan.
His information may surprise you. Uh, Linda, you're going to cruise direct here. He'll tell you mm -hmm. when it's... Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Pastor Earl. Thank you once again, Church, for inviting me. Uh, second time, actually. And so nice to see Barb and then Brother Isaac and a few other friends, Pastor Mark, once again. And I just would like to start with a word of prayer. Now, this is actually a multiple hour presentation and uh, Pastor Earl insisted I keep it to 45 minutes. So pray for me. <laughs> because it's gonna be very in-depth and uh, there's a lot of information that we're gonna be covering this morning. But everything that's gonna be presented is truth from scriptures. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning. We thank you, Father, for for the wonderful church conference that you've organized, help organized. Um, thank you for Pastor Earl, Pastor Mark, and their church community, and 